we're going to begin. Let me get, begin the recording. Get that going. There we go. Oop, turn it off. Share the screen. See if anyone has a picture there. Oops, that didn't work. Nope. All right. Can somebody confirm you're hearing me, please? I hear you. All right. Let's uh, begin. Today is October 5th, and we should finish Chapter 2 today, although we're a little bit behind schedule, so we'll see if we can manage that. Uh, remember, you got a quiz. Is this your first qu real quiz on uh, Wednesday? The quiz is going to cover chapters one and 10 and the start of chapter two in labs zero, one, and two. Any questions about that? All right. We have a lab later on today. I'll talk about that in the lab. So let's go to chapter two. Oh, that's good enough. So we have discussed the carbohydrates and said we can break them into three categories, the monosaccharides, the disaccharides, and the polysaccharides. So let's move on a little bit with the carbohydrates. The polysaccharides consist of many saccharides, poly, many saccharides. The saccharide is a simple sugar. They can be straight or in a straight chain of the uh, saccharides hooked together, or they can be branched chains. An example of a polysaccharide is starch. In starch, it's mostly a straight chain uh, link of glucose molecules, one hooked, af uh, hooked after the other. Uh, glycogen is uh, how animals store glucose. And it is similar to starch, except that it's a branch chain. And you can find glycogen in livers as well as muscle tissue. Uh, cellulose is the, the way that uh, green plants, I don't know if store is the right word for glucose, but green plants use glucose to make cellulose, and then they uh, use that for the, their cell wall, the structure of their cells. They're all glucose polymers, and they're all covalently, although they're covalently bonded differently. Uh, we're not going to really talk about chitin. It's also a, a polymer, two sugars repeating. And you don't need to know this chart. I'm just showing it. Oops, I'm moving it. Didn't mean to do that. Let me move this away. Let's see if I can blow this up. Showing you the different polysaccharides, starch, where glucose is just linked together. Uh, glycogen, where glucose is linked together, but the linking is branched, meaning the, the link branches. Uh, cellulose is just glucose linked together, although it's a different link. And uh, not only is it linked together, let me see if I can blow this up even further because you can't really see it well. I don't know where I moved here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the glucose is linked in the dark covalently bonded linkage here. And then you see the broken yellowish bond or yellow brown bond this way. That is a hydrogen bonding. So the glucose is hydrogen bonding with its neighbor. And that's why cellulose is so difficult to digest and most animals can't digest it. And that's um, the, all the links as well as the fact that this is a, an unusual link, um, 
Maybe I can show that up here. So uh, in starch, uh, the glucose is hooked together with a 1,5 glycosidic linkage, 1,4, sorry, I said 1,5, 1,4. And it looks something like that. And with cellulose, that's a different linkage. And they're showing it uh, going up. Any questions about any of that? We'll talk briefly about peptidoglycan. I think it's not in this lecture lesson, but in a future lesson. Uh, peptidoglycan also is a linkage of sugars, one after the other. And it is, it's got a, a short peptides in it. We'll talk about that later. But uh, uh, the point is, is that it is a uh, polysaccharide, at least this part of it. All right, any questions? Uh, peptidoglycan is found in bacterial cells, if you remember. Any questions about any of that? If not, that's it for the carbohydrates. Let's talk about the lipids. Uh, lipids consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And although they do consist of all these, most lipids are mostly carbon and hydrogen. Any question about that? Now the picture's okay. I don't have the background there. I meant to get that going before class and I forgot about it. So if I get a break, I'll put that behind me and then the picture will be a little better. Uh, lipids are mostly nonpolar and insoluble in water, meaning they are hydrophobic. There is one exception and we'll talk about that. It is uh, at least partially polar and soluble in water, that exception, but most are nonpolar and insoluble in water. Lipids are structural and energy storage molecules. Lipids are primary components of the cell membrane. And we can break lipids into three categories, the simple lipids, the complex lipids, and the steroids. Uh, fatty acids is a major component of many lipids, not all lipids, but many lipids. It consists of a fairly long chain of carbon held together, or not held together, it's held together by covalent bonding, but it has hydrogen bonds on the sides of that carbon. And here we're looking at a, uh, a, uh, uh, fatty acid. I'm trying to blow this up. There we go. It does have some oxygen, but not very many. The oxygen is only here, and then the rest of the hydrocarbon is right here, which is uh, the rest of the fatty acid. Uh, the COOH group can bind to something, so this OH will come off as the carbon binds to something, but we'll always have that one oxygen. You can have saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acid. A saturated fatty acid is where the carbons have the maximum hydrogens attached to the carbon. Every carbon linkage to another carbon is also in a fat saturated fatty acid is a, a single covalent linkage between carbons. In the unsaturated fatty acids, there is a double carbon link, at least one, in the unsaturated fatty acid. Sorry, here I've got a tickle in my throat. <coughs> when you have a double carbon bond between the two carbons, uh, there will be fewer carbons. Uh, fewer hydrogens attached to the carbon. And that'll cause a kink in the chain, which is shown here. Let me see if I can blow this up. Right here, we have a uh, unsaturated fatty acid, and it's unsaturated simply by having one double carbon link right here. And you can see that if you have the double carbon link, you've got 
one less hydrogen here and one less hydrogen here. Although that hydrogen doesn't have to be missing here, it can be missing there. Any question about any of that? The simple lipids, also called fats or triglycerides, contain fatty acids and glycerol. And there are always three fatty acids attached to the glycerol. So there's the glycerol there. There's the fatty acid. We remove water in uh, dehydration synthesis. And then this carbon of the fatty acid combined directly to the oxygen of the glycerol and water is formed. And anyway, say, simple lipid or a fat or a triglyceride is shown here. And it's called triglycerides because there are three fatty acids linked to a glycerol. So triglyceride, uh, meaning glyceride from the glycerol. Any question about that? Triglycerides are the body's richest energy source and it's stored as adipose in animals. Uh, if ever you're needing energy to move from one location to another, or maybe just to stay warm, and you have uh, something to eat, and let's say you gotta carry it, and so you wanna carry your, your, as much as you can, and you want it to provide as much energy as you can, you wanna carry fats because they provide the most energy. Any question about that? That's not necessarily the healthiest thing to eat, but it will provide you with the most energy source per pound of object. Uh, if you wanna see the most common lipid in your body, just look at your belly. Uh, that's where there are some triglycerides that we call fats. And triglycerides are also the most common dietary lipid in our diet. I suppose that might not be true for some people in the Mediterranean who eat a large number of olive oil. Uh, that might be the most common fat in their diet. But in Americans, the most common fat is... Uh, well, is a triglyceride, the most common lipid, I should say. Any question about simple lipids? Okay, there are also complex lipids. And one of the complex lipid is a phospholipid shown here. A phospholipid has two fatty acids linked right here and right here linked to glycerol, let me blow that up. The glycerol is right here and it's bent this way. And you'll notice that one of the uh, fatty acids is saturated, the other is unsaturated. There's the glycerol. And then the third position of the glycerol, we don't have a fatty acid linked to it. We have a phosphate group. And these are phospholipids. The phosphate group is polar. The fatty acid groups are nonpolar. So a phospholipid is both polar in this region and nonpolar in this region. And that makes this molecule shown here by phasing, that it can dissolve in both water because of this part right here and it can dissolve, dissolve in lipids or fats because of this part of the molecule here. Another example of a biphasic molecule is detergents. And that's why we use detergents to wash our clothes because this part of the molecule will help bring out the, uh, well, we don't use phospholipids to wash your clothes, but the, the uh, lipid soluble portion can help dissolve of the detergents, can dissolve the oils in our clothes. 
and then the water, uh, as well as the, the uh, water soluble portion of the detergent can help dissolve the water soluble molecules. And that's why detergent washes clothes better than if you were to just wash them in straight water alone. And the detergent and the water will wash it, the clothes better than if you were to wash the clothes in something like oil, and nobody does that. So there's not much point in talking about it. So uh, the point is phospholipids can dissolve in both water because of the, the head of the phospholipid, and it can dissolve in lipids because of the tail of the phospholipid. Now, when we look at our cell membrane, it looks like this, the main molecule being phospholipid, and it forms a lipid bilayer where one side is facing out of the cell membrane and the other side is facing inside the cell. And then the fatty acid portion of the phospholipid is on the inside of the cell membrane. Anyways, this is what our cell membranes look like. There are other molecules in there besides phospholipid, but phospholipid is the main molecule. You can actually, this is closer to what ours looks like. And that is it has a cholesterol in the membrane and the cholesterol helps give support and strength to the membrane, the cell membrane. Uh, some organisms, like organisms which uh, grow in extremely cold temperatures would have a cell membrane looking like this. And uh, what you have is, is that it's much, what, less, um, much less organized and the, there are two fatty acids attached to the phospholipid, which are unsaturated. That's why it's bending. In fact, that one looks like it's got uh, uh, an unsaturated carbon there and there as well. So there's at least two on that one. And this one there too, there's going to be one there and one there. Uh, the reason for this is that the more unsaturated fatty acids you have in it, the uh, cooler the membrane can be and remain lipid. Any question about that? And then for bacteria that live at very warm temperatures, they might be more saturated fatty acids because they can take a higher temperature to remain a lipid, a liquid, a lipid liquid, I guess I should say. All right, any question about any of that? When you take phospholipids and put them in water, they will start to form this bilayer. And that's because the fatty acid portion of the phospholipid wants to be away from the water which would be on this side and this side. And then it just keeps forming more phospholipids coming together and this orientation until the uh, phospholipids form uh, this shape or perhaps this shape, which is very similar. And the point is, is that the uh, fatty acid portions are on the inside, the water is on the outside, and there may be water on the inside. What does this shape look like? What does it remind you of? Come on, someone must notice. What's this remind you of? Okay, we'll move forward. No one's gonna guess. So uh, remember, phospholipids are the main molecule of the cell membrane, and you can find phospholipids in the cell membrane.
they're not found in a whole lot of other places. Well, I should say uh, you can also find them in any membrane. So it can be the nuclear membrane or the uh, organelle membrane. I'm saying outside of the membranes, uh, phospholipids, you don't really find them in one location, although they're made and then moved to the membrane. Okay, uh, the last of the lipids are the steroids, and we're going to say steroids and sterols. A steroid is a four inter interconnected rigid carbon ring right here linked together, and wherever there's a point, remember there's a carbon, and there's a point here, so there's a carbon there. So carbon, 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 carbon. The point is it's connected by four uh, rings and that's a steroid. If there's an OH group attached to the steroid, we call it a sterol. So here we have one OH group attached. And so this is a sterol. This is one you're probably familiar with. This is cholesterol. And as I stated, sterols, particularly cholesterol, is an important part of the animal plasma membrane. It's in between the phospholipids and it adds strength to that membrane. Any question about any of that? All right, so that's it for the lipids. Let's go on and talk about the third group, the proteins. Proteins are essential in the structure of cells and in the function. Proteins have many different functions. There can be structural proteins, which can be found in bone, muscle, and hair. There can be enzymes, which are molecules which speed up chemical reactions. The protein can be a transport protein, and that moves chemicals across the a membrane, like the cell membrane, and the transport protein can bring that molecule into the cell. There are regulatory proteins that help regulate the body's function, like hormones, such as a growth hormone in a child. It encourages the child or helps the child grow. So that's a regulatory protein. There are proteins responsible for movement, so like when I'm walking, the reason why that happens is the proteins in my muscles contracting. There are proteins which are responsible for some bacterial toxins, generally an exotoxin, we'll talk later about toxins, uh, are proteins. And the point here is this, just that some proteins are toxins. If you don't know what a toxin is, it's something that's toxic to us. And then there are proteins which are antibodies. And these are proteins that we or an organism makes to help defend itself from a foreign invader, like a microbe. And as you can tell, proteins do a large variety of different things more so than all the other biological molecules. Proteins differ more than all of the other biological molecules. And one of the reasons why proteins differ the most from the other biological molecule is that proteins consist of the monomers of amino acids. And unlike a carbohydrate, which is, there are only a, a handful of different uh, simple sugars that can make a polymer. And with the lipids, that's also the true, they can be made of glycerol and then they're made of a fatty acid. And there's only a few different fatty acids, but there's 20 different amino acids in humans. And, you just link the amino acids together in the protein. 
And because there's 20 of them that differ, the proteins are the most variable of the biological molecule. Any question about any of that? All right, let's look at an amino acid in a little more detail. It has a central carbon, and attached to that central carbon is one hydrogen group. Also attached to that central carbon is an R group. And the R group is just a biological molecule. There are in humans 20 different R groups because the R group determines what amino acid there it is. And each amino acid has a different R group. So there's 20 different R groups to the amino acid in humans. Now I'm talking about this with humans, but most organisms have about 20 different amino acids. Uh, I used to know the highest number, there's a bacteria that has the highest number and it's something like 21 or 22 or 23 amino acids. Generally, if an organism takes another amino acid that humans don't use, then they'll throw out an amino acid. And that's why most organism, organisms have about 20 amino acids. Okay. Uh, let me, I probably should have talked about the R group last. Let me show you some R groups. Uh, there's one R group for the amino acid tyrosine. And each amino acid will have a different R group, which is shown here. The simplest R group is just hydrogen right here. Let me blow that up. And that's with the amino acid glycine. For the amino acid alanine, all you have is a methyl group right here for the R group. And you can have combinations of methyl groups. A chain involving methyl groups. You can also have uh, rings. Uh, let's go back. Um, some of the R groups are nonpolar, like this one here. And some of the R groups have polar regions, like this group here has got a polar group right there, the OH. And then this NH here and that NH there are polar. <clears throat> Let's end the show here and go back. So the R groups can be nonpolar or they can be have a combination of polar and nonpolar depending on the R group. I don't think there's any R group which is only polar. Yeah, I think that's probably the most polar and this region right here as well as maybe this portion right there is nonpolar, but that region right here and this region right here is polar. So also on the amino acid, you have an amino group and that's what gives the uh, amino acid its name. The amino group is either NH2 or NH plus, and that's also on the central carbon of the amino acid. And then on the opposite side of the amino group, you have a carboxyl group, and that's COOH or COO with a negative charge. Any questions about that? I didn't say that right. Did I say NH? That should be NH3 plus or NH2. What often happens is the hydrogen will leave the carboxyl group and then join the amino group. So that's where that hydrogen comes from and why we will be in NH3. And you don't really need to know that, I'm just explaining it. Any questions about that? 
So you should know the structure of an amino acid. There could be a question on it. All right. We need, uh, do we need to know the structure of the second one in the picture or just the first one of the tyrosine? Uh, you're talking about the amino group and the carboxyl group? Or are you talking about this slide? No, the first picture. Yeah, you second. need to know the amino group and the carboxyl group. But we don't need to know the cyclic. And you should cyclic. know the R group too. Although you don't need to memorize all the different R groups. But you should remember the third position is an R group. And that R group determines what amino acid you're, you are. Gotcha. OK. Yeah. All right. All right, amino acids are linked together one after another to make proteins. And they're linked by a bond we call a peptide bond. What happens is you hit uh, one amino acid coming together with an amino, another amino acid. And in dehydration synthesis, the OH comes off of this amino acid and the hydrogen comes off of that amino acid forming water why it's dehydration synthesis. And then this N directly links to that carbon. That's actually a rare bond found in living organisms where nitrogen is bound to carbon. And it's even a rare, fairly rare bond in the universe but it is found in proteins and peptides, and that's why we call it a peptide bond. Any question about that? All right, there are four levels of protein structure. The primary uh, level, the secondary level, the tertiary level, and the quaternary level. And I've got a little video to explain the four different levels. Let's let it load. Everyone is calling this the new billion dollar stimulus. In this video, we're gonna talk about the structure of proteins. And what basically is a protein? A protein is a polymer consistent of many amino acids. So each amino acid represented by the circle is a monomer that forms the protein. Whenever you have many amino acids, it's also called a polypeptide. And the bond that connects each individual amino acid residue is a peptide bond. So let's talk about the individual structure of an amino acid. So an amino acid has... Sorry, I'm gonna skip over the discussion of an amino acid because I wanna talk about the four levels of protein structure. Let's go back. Now let's talk about the different levels of protein structure. There's four levels that you need to know. The primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and finally, the quaternary structure. Now, the primary structure is simply based on the sequence of the amino acids found in the protein. The sequence determines the shape of the protein. If you replace just one amino acid with another, it will completely change the shape of the protein. So the shape and its function is primarily determined by the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure describes the localized shape of a protein. And there's two of them that you need to be familiar with, the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. In the alpha helix, you could see that it's stabilized by hydrogen bonds. The NH group of one amino acid interacts with the carbonyl group of another amino acid. And each turn contains about 3.6 amino acid residues. Now here is a visual illustration of the beta pleated sheet. Just like the alpha helix, it too is stabilized by hydrogen bonds between the carbonyl group of one amino acid and the NH group of another amino acid. 
Next up, we have the tertiary structure, which represents the three-dimensional complete folding pattern of the protein. And so here's the visual illustration of it. So we could see some areas is just a straight chain. Here we have an alpha helix, and here we have a beta pleated sheet. Now, the tertiary structure is one individual subunit. When you combine multiple subunits, you create a quaternary structure. So hemoglobin is an example of that. It has four individual subunits, two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. So hemoglobin is a protein with a quaternary structure. And so that's basically it for this video. Hopefully it gave you a basic understanding of proteins and the four levels of structure that they have. Thanks for watching. Okay, Let's go help people customize the same at Liberty Mutual. Uh, okay, who said? Here we go. Why don't you just close it down? Um, the video only talked about hydrogen bonds. I'm not sure why they only talked about hydrogen bonds. So let's talk a little bit more about the uh, four levels of protein structure. Hydrogen bonds are important, but there are other interactions that are also important in the four levels of protein structure. I need to find another video. Uh, I had a really good one, but it uses flash and so it won't work anymore. And uh, I found this one on the internet and it was nice and short. So that's why I'm using it. Like I said, it's pretty good, but it does only talk about hydrogen bonds and, and there are other interactions you need to know about. Okay, the primary structure is a specific sequence of amino acids, just one amino acid after the other. And the primary structure happens when the protein is first made. All it is is a bunch of amino acids hooked one after another. However, the primary or the uh, amino acids in the primary structure can start interacting with each other. When they start interacting with each other, what happens is the localized amino acid, many neighboring amino acids, can start interacting with another neighbor amino acid. So in the secondary structure, it's interactions happening between neighboring amino acids. You got that? In the tertiary structure, you can have similar interactions, but they don't have to be nearby amino acids, meaning neighbors. They can be amino acids all over the protein interacting with another amino acid. And we'll talk about the tertiary in just a minute. So in the localized interactions, what happens is one amino acid interacts with another amino acid. And that could be a hydrogen bond, which is shown right here. But it could also be an ionic bond. If this red amino acid has a positive charge, and the blue amino acid has a negative charge, you can form an ionic bond between these amino acids, okay? Another thing you can have is repulsion. If this pink amino acid has a positive charge and the yellow one also has a positive charge, these amino acids will be repulsed from each other. That's an interaction between neighboring amino acids. Another repulsion is if the pink one is a polar amino acid and the yellow one is largely a uh, nonpolar amino acid, they will be repulsed from each other, okay? If ever they're too polar or too nonpolar, there will be an attraction between them. Meaning if this is a polar one and that's a polar one, the positive end of the amino acid will be attracted to the negative end of this amino acid. We're not going to talk much about uh, nonpolar interactions. Let's talk about this group right here. Uh, but uh, when you put oil molecules together, they are attracted to each other by van der Waal forces. And that's why we get a liquid out of oil. 
It's because the oil molecules are attracted to each other. And that's why the molecules form a lip lipid. If it wasn't a lipid, it would be a gas where the molecules aren't really attracted to each other, or uh, they would be bound together in a solid. Okay, does everyone understand enough what I mean by van der Waal forces? It's where two nonpolar molecules are attracted together, and it's a very, very weak attraction. And it's just you have one nonpolar molecule, it'll be attracted to another nonpolar molecule. That's one interaction. Let me see if I discussed all of them. Ionic bonds I discussed, hydrogen bonds I discussed, and then uh, um, hydrophobic interactions. And I talked about the two different repulsions too. All right, any questions about uh, the secondary structure? Uh, you can form, the, the video said, two different shapes with uh, the secondary structure. We're not going to talk about the different shapes. And in reality, you can form three shapes. You can have the alpha helix shown here. You can have the beta pleated sheet shown here. And then you can have the random coil, which is shown kind of here. Okay? But you don't need to know that. I'm not going to quiz you on that. Anyways, with the tertiary structure, you can have interactions between amino acids, but unlike the secondary structure, where the interactions are always between nearby amino acids, in the tertiary structure, the interactions between amino acids can happen all over the protein chain. Like in this interaction right here, or this one right there would be better. It looks like uh, this amino acid at the end of the protein, and this one near the beginning of the protein are being attracted together, either by an ionic bond or a hydrogen bond, or maybe by van der Waal forces, okay? So you get all of the interactions in the tertiary level that you see in the secondary level. The difference is, like I said, it's more than just the nearby amino acids. It can happen between any amino acids in the protein chain. And that includes all hydrogen bonds, all hydrophobic interactions, attractions, uh, ionic bond attractions, and then you can have repulsion in the tertiary level, and that can be two uh, positive ionic bonds being repulsed from each other, or it can be a hydrophobic amino acid being repulsed from a hydrophilic amino acid. And then there's one other attraction that we see in the tertiary structure that is not seen in the secondary structure. And let me blow it up. You can also have the disulfide linkage between two cysteine amino acids. So this amino acid has a sulfhydryl group attached to the cysteine amino acid. And this cysteine over here also has a sulfhydryl group attached to the cysteine. Well, the hydrogens can come off of the sulfhydryl groups and then form the disulfide bridge, which is a covalent bond between this cysteine and that cysteine. A covalent bond is much stronger than a hydrogen bond shown here, and it's much stronger than an ionic bond as well, which we, we shown here. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit, I think, later about uh, hydrogen bonds. Uh, when my mother used to curl up her hairs and the curls, and then she put the hair bonnet on, which then put steam in the curls, 
and then she would take it off and take out the curls. She was forming hydrogen bonds, linkages between her hair to make the curl. And then she would go out in the Western Oregon air or the Western uh, Washington air and there'd be moisture in the air and her curl would sag, telling you that the moisture in the air broke the hydrogen bonds, which made the wave in her hair. And so the wave would sag, showing you how weak the hydrogen bonds are. On the other hand, if someone goes and gets a perm in their hair, what you're forming is the disulfide bridges between the hair molecules. And that's why with the perm, it'll last a month, even if you go into the shower. It's a much stronger bond. All right, any question about the tertiary structure? So for many proteins, the highest level they'll ever form is a tertiary structure. And that's because that protein only has one polypeptide in the protein. And so the highest level it can get is the tertiary structure. And so for most enzymes that you know of, in fact, all enzymes that I know of, the highest level of the protein structure that it can form is the tertiary structure. And that would be true for the enzyme catalase or uh, catecholase, the enzyme renin, if you know what that one is. Um, we talked about uh, sucrase, okay. All of them can only go up to our tertiary structure, but there are some proteins that are made up of more than one polypeptide unit. And that would be an example, hemoglobin, which is made up of four different protein units. Antibody is also made up of four uh, polypeptides. I, I'm not sure how many polypeptides make insulin, so I'm not gonna state how many, but hemoglobin and, and uh, antibodies are made up of four polypeptide units. And the protein isn't final until each of the polypeptides come together. And then the, each polypeptide interacts with the other polypeptides, which can be any of the interactions we saw in the tertiary structure. And the point is, is that the interactions between the different polypeptide units is what we call the quaternary structure of the protein. Only some proteins have a quaternary structure like hemoglobin and antibodies. All right, any question about that? Okay. Uh, we can also look at the shape of the protein and describe them as globular. That's a roughly compact, roughly spherical molecule. And hemoglobin takes on a globular protein. Most enzymes are globular. But you can also have a protein which is fibrous, more thread-like, and collagen and the other structural proteins can be fibrous. Besides being more complicated than the other biological molecules, proteins can be conjugated to other, um, other molecules. And a conjugated protein is a combination of amino acids with other organic or inorganic components. The conjugated proteins are usually named by their non-protein components like a glycoprotein is glyc, we call it glycogen, not glycogen, but glycose, no, I'm losing it. I don't remember what glycogen is. It's carbohydrates bound to the protein, okay? A lipoprotein is where we have a protein and it's bound to a lipid. And you can find lipoproteins in your blood 
And you can find glycoproteins well in your blood and also on the, the uh, cell membrane. All right, any question about conjugated proteins? So remember, proteins are more complex and diverse than the other three biological molecules. And that's largely because they have more building blocks. At least humans have 20 different amino acids. And most organisms have 20 different amino acids. All right, let's move on to talking about protein denaturation. Protein denaturation is where the protein loses its three-dimensional shape, where it can break hydrogen bonds and other bonds, and then change its shape and potentially change its function. If you change the shape, enough, the protein will not function. And that's why we say it's denatured because the protein no longer functions. Proteins can be denatured when they're put at the wrong temperature, the wrong pH, or at the wrong salt concentration. Any question about any of that? All right. We'll talk a little bit more about denaturation of proteins in a future lesson. Let's talk about our last of the biological molecules, the nucleic acids. There are two nucleic acids you need to know about. There's DNA and RNA. Uh, DNA is an acronym for uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA is an acronym or abbreviation for ribonucleic acid. Nucleic acids consist of the monomer called nucleotides. So all nucleic acids, meaning DNA and RNA, consist of monomers that we call nucleotides. A nucleotide is made up of three units. So here we have two nucleotides, one here and then one here. And each nucleotide has three subunits. A nucleotide has a nitrogen containing base shown here. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later. The nitrogen containing base is what gives the nucleotide its name. And then there's a sugar group, which is always either ribose in RNA or deoxyribose in DNA, and a phosphate group. And that phosphate group has a charge, a negative charge. So all nucleotides has three parts to it. And then we simply link the nucleotides together to make the DNA and the RNA. Okay, any question about that? All right. Uh, the only difference between uh, ribose and deoxyribose is, let me see, is this deoxyribose or? Oh, I think this is D. Deoxyribose. No, I don't have it shown. Uh, the difference is that there's an extra oxygen in uh, ribose. And deoxyribose has one less. OH group. Let me go back to that. So I think on ribose, you'll have two OH groups here, but I have to look that up to be certain. And I think this is deoxyribose for DNA. Oh, it's definitely DNA because uh, in DNA, uh, we have each 
nucleic acid, meaning each DNA strand, binds to another strand of DNA, but the binding between the two strands of DNA is only hydrogen bonds. Everyone clear on that? We'll talk more about that later. Um, and here, I know it's deoxyribose because you have deoxyribose in DNA. And this adenine is binding to thymine with hydrogen bond there. So this is DNA because you don't have that happening in RNA. RNA is a single molecule and DNA is a double molecule but there's no covalent linkage between the two molecules of DNA. There's only hydrogen bonds holding the two DNA molecules together. Anyways, let's talk more about the nitrogen containing base. There are two different types of nitrogen containing base, a purine and a pyrimidine. Hmm. Same one there. There are, in DNA are two purines, and you can know them by adenine or A and guanine or G. In DNA, there are also two pyrimidines, and that's cytosine or C uh, or anthymine or T. And that's all the nucleotides you have in DNA. Now in RNA, we have the same, three of the same nucleotides. So we have adenine, guanine, and cytosine. But in RNA, we do not have thymine. Thymine is replaced by uracil or U. And uracil replaces thymine, and both of them are pyrimidines, okay? In DNA, the purines A will bind with T, and this will be a hydrogen bonding between the A, sorry, the A and the T. And that's shown here, the A right here, the nitrogen here can hydrogen bond to the hydrogen there on the uh, nucleotide base right here, which is T. And then the hydrogen of the uh, adenine here can hydrogen bond to the oxygen of thymine there. The point is A will bind with hydrogen bonds to T and vice versa T to A and G can hydrogen bond to C and vice versa, C can hydrogen bond to G in DNA. Any question about any of that? So A and T are complementary bases and C and G are complementary bases. You should further know that A and T can form two hydrogen bonds between e each A and T. Let me see if I got that shown. But C and G can form three hydrogen bonds between them. And it's shown here, roll it up, between the C and the G, there's three hydrogen bonds that can form. Between the A and the T, there's only two. Go ahead and shut down. All right. So in RNA, remember the uracil replaces the T, which is found in DNA. An easy way to remember which are pyrimidines is that the name pyrimidine has a Y in it. And for DNA, cytosine and thymine have a Y in it. The purines, A and G, do not have a Y. So that's an easy way to remember the purines from the pyrimidines. Now, if we're talking about uh, RNA, you have to remember the uracil 
you're going to replace the thymine. Uracil doesn't have a Y in it, but because it's replacing the thymine, a uracil is a primitive. Any question about that? So in DNA, we have the sugar, which is uh, deoxyribose, and it's double-stranded molecule, where one strand of DNA is covalently linked together, one nucleotide after the other. And then the nucleotide bases on the steps of the strand, of this strand can bind hydrogen bond with the nucleotide bases on the second strand of DNA. And that's all the linkage between two DNA molecules. All it is is hydrogen bonds, which are very weak. And this hydrogen bond right here can break and reform all the time. And if it breaks and reforms all the time, and that's true for all of the hydrogen bonds, why is it that the DNA in our cells is held together. Anyone want to guess? Because of the covalent bonds on the other strand? No, the covalent bond only holds one strand of DNA together. My question is, why is the DNA in our body, which is held, which is double-stranded and the two strands are only held together by hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds break all the time. Why is the DNA in our cells double-stranded? If these hydrogen bonds, which hold the double strands together, break and reform all the time. Okay, I need to move on because we're running out of time and I wanna try and finish this lesson. Uh, it's because there are so many hydrogen bonds in a double-stranded molecule of DNA that when this one breaks, and there's actually two there, the others are there to hold the DNA together. And then when this one here breaks, or that one there breaks, this one will reform. And so uh, the hydrogen bonds are breaking and reforming all the time, but there are enough of them in our cells that the DNA is kept generally as a double-stranded molecule, okay? The exception would be when you're replicating the DNA, and we haven't talked about that yet, or when you're transcribing the DNA. Then it's actually a single-stranded molecule of DNA. Okay, the other thing I need to point out here is, is that it's the sugar phosphates of the nucleotides which form the backbone and covalently link the DNA single strand together. The nucleotide base is not part of the backbone. I don't know if you can see that here or not, but the nucleotide is on the step and uh, the sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, holds one strand of DNA together. And that's a covalent linkage. The base is on the step, meaning on the side, and it's gonna hydrogen bond with the base to the complementary nucleotide on the other strand of DNA. DNA also twists like a twisted ladder. And so we can say DNA is like a spiral staircase. Okay, all right, any question about DNA? If not, let's move on to RNA. The sugar is ribose. It is a single-stranded molecule. There's only one strand of RNA in our cell's RNA. It is held together by the sugar phosphate backbone, meaning in RNA, the nucleotides are linked together by a sugar phosphate backbone. The base is on the side, and there are only four bases, uracil, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. 
There are three major kinds of RNA in cells. Transfer RNA, also called tRNA, messenger RNA, or mRNA, and ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. All of these three types of RNA have the same nucleotides, meaning the same uh, ribose and the same phosphate groups, and that holds the RNA together in the strand, the single strand. And it has the same uh, four nucleotide bases. So how do we know when we look at tRNA and know it's tRNA and that it's different from messenger RNA or rRNA? How do we, as well as the cell, know? Or another way of wording it, what's the difference between tRNA and the other forms of RNA? Nobody knows, nobody wants to guess. The only difference is the sequence of nucleotides. That's the only difference between tRNA, messenger RNA, and rRNA. If the sequence is in the tRNA sequence, then it's a tRNA molecule. If the sequence is in the messenger RNA sequence, then it's an mRNA. If the sequence is in the rRNA, then it's an rRNA. Okay, all right. Uh, the last molecule we need to talk about is ATP. This is a nucleotide, but it's a special nucleotide, adenosine triphosphate. It is the primary energy source for all cells, meaning if the cell needs energy to perform an activity, the cell usually gets its energy needs from ATP. ATP does have ribose, that sugar. It does have three phosphate groups, and it does have adenine in it. That's why it's called ATP. And it is a nucleotide with three phosphates. Uh, this phosphate linked to this phosphate with the squiggly line, that's a high energy bond. And if the cell needs energy, it can break this bond and then use that energy for its energy needs. Uh, this second phosphate is also linked to the first phosphate with a squiggly line, meaning this is another high energy bond. And if the cell needs more energy than this bond can provide, the cell can also break off the second phosphate group and then use that energy for its energy needs. Okay, any question about any of that? If the cell needs energy, it usually obtains its energy from ATP. So we say ATP is the energy currency in cells. ATP is made by dehydration synthesis. So what you do is you get ADP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates, add on inorganic phosphate, add on energy, and then go that way. You do form water, which isn't terribly important. And then ATP. And then if the cell needs energy, it can break this off, this bond off, by adding on water, going this way in the reaction, making ADP, and that releases energy. And the cell can use that energy for its energy needs. All right, here's a question for you. I won't have time to get an answer for you. What molecules that we have discussed have hydrogen bonds, and the hydrogen bonds give the molecule important properties? Well, obviously water, as hydrogen bonds, amino acids have hydrogen bonds, proteins have hydrogen bonds, nucleotides have hydrogen bonds, make DNA, and then uh, nucleic acids would be the DNA. All right, and it's not mentioned here, but carbohydrates can have hydrogen bonds. And what would happen to these molecules if all of the hydrogen bonds were one day to disappear? 
Anyone guess? What would happen to all of these molecules if all the hydrogen bonds were to disappear? Well, let's make it simpler. You have liquid water, which has hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. If all of the hydrogen bonds were to disappear, what would happen? All right, you guys think about that, and we'll discuss that maybe in the start of the lab. Any questions? All right, I'll see you in the lab at 6.30. 6.30.